Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the topic is uh, design rooms for fiber and force concrete. It's the first time we introduce in a standard like, like this, so the model code. Um, and uh, I'll try to explain the main uh, difficult, uh, difficult problem we have to solve to do it. Uh, I will start from some examples of application. And after, I would like to uh, switch uh, to uh, the general framework uh, of model code and how this material is introduced. Um, I would like to speak about uh, uh, the main two chapters we have introduced, one on the materials, the other one on the, on the structures. And after, I would like to conclude with very few and simple examples of application of the code. OK, this is, uh, these are the milestone of, uh, of uh, fiber and force concrete, in my opinion. You see, uh, starting from uh, uh, the top, uh, the top left, uh, the famous uh, Postdamer Platz uh, uh, Foundation, suggested by Professor Falkner um, from Braunschweig University, where essentially he was able to uh, prevent uh, uh, the use of pump in order to save uh, the water in the zone close to the Postdamer Platz. And essentially, he pumped uh, the fiber and force concrete uh, at a certain depth. There was a huge uh, pressure because there was a, a, a huge uh, um, uh, difference of, uh, of um, uh, uh, water pressure, if you like, because uh, the phreatic uh, water was uh, at about uh, 18, uh, 16 meters of, uh, of pressure, of, the, of uh, um, different of, of height. And uh, uh, it tried to use uh, just fiber and force concrete without any pump, and it created a a very good uh, slab, uh, and when he removed uh, all the water, uh, no cracks could uh, uh, could be seen, and so that, uh, this was probably the most important uh, application we had at that time. And after that, there are a lot of other applications in relation to soil, because, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, redundancy uh, favors a lot uh, the use of this material, so you have sheet piles, uh, in uh, um, uh, essentially suggested by the Josva Raven group. Uh, you have also the possibility to substitute uh, the railway sleeper, uh, some foundation, uh, tunneling, of course, and uh, also we try to use this material uh, in order to um, useful uh, retaining structures. And, uh, um, but we don't have only interaction with soil. We have also application in the building. So for instance, this is a famous uh, uh, application we had in Valencia, the Oceanographic Museum, suggested by Professor Sarna in Valencia. And uh, here, some application uh, to in, uh, uh, industry, inter inter industrialize the plant, uh, where you could put uh, any hole in the web without uh, taking into account too much uh, the, the detailing of the reinforcement. And uh, they were pre-stressed. Here we had uh, a, a mesh inside, but it was a uh, shot crit with fiber, with steel fibers. Uh, and uh, uh, we use also, we have some application in, uh, uh, suggested by Falkner in Stuttgart for the uh, tall buildings. Uh, we use in Italy for roofing. And also here, a very, more, a very famous uh, solution uh, suggested in Canada with uh, ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete by Lafarge Group. Recently, uh, Pedro Serna suggested in Valencia also this uh, pedestrian footbridge made of ultra high performance fiber and force concrete, whereas the slab are only made of ultra high performance without any other reinforcement. Um, and uh, it's a very famous, this is also a very famous application we saw uh, just last year in September, the Museum uh, of Mediterranean in, uh, built in, in uh, Marseille, in the, in the port of Marseille. There is a a very long uh, uh, pedestrian bridge uh, made of ultra high performance and uh, uh, pre-stressed. And we have also all this uh, uh, wonderful uh, building uh, which uh, adopt uh, uh, ultra high performance everywhere. So in uh, the finishing, so the, the facade, which is uh, not closed, but is uh, a real nice. Uh, we have also in the, in the, in the columns, we have in the, in the beams, uh, and so we can have an idea of what we can do by means of this material, because it's very interesting, because it's able to, uh, to follow uh, very difficult uh, architectural uh, drawings. And uh, um, 
in the past, we had also a lot of application for retrofitting. For instance, this is uh, something suggested uh, in Japan to retrofit the dam uh, with the, the use of uh, fibers and shotcrete. But uh, in Italy, for instance, we used uh, we have some application uh, to reinforce the the uh, notes because uh, you know that we had two very important uh, earthquakes. So we used this uh, in order to solve some problem like this. But uh, you can uh, adjust uh, the channel water. You can uh, uh, rapidly uh, substitute uh, the top slab of bridges here in uh, in Japan. And uh, uh, this means that you can generally use also for uh, retrofitting. In this conference, we saw other two applications, another pedestrian bridge in Netherlands, and uh, also the Centro Valle, uh, suggested by Professor Murtoni, which is also as a reinforcement inside, but is made of shot grid with fibers. So uh, there are a lot of applications. If we look to the percentage of uh, fibers used in the market, we can say that until now, the industrial ground floor represents about 45% of the market, the tunneling 30%. And I would like to say that uh, I had uh, the opportunity to face with a lot of uh, um, designers in Austria, and they are uh, working uh, very much on the use of uh, model code uh, to design uh, uh, tunneling made of uh, fibers. And uh, of course, we have other use uh, very, very well known, like pipes, uh, like uh, septic tanks or uh, box culver, but the global amount is, uh, is uh, not so significant uh, at the moment for the market. There are some uh, application in progress. That means that we already done, but uh, we are looking on in order to, to see if uh, all the rules are good or if you have some other problems to solve. And uh, essentially, we are speaking about strip foundation, where there are a lot uh, of uh, new applications also in Europe, uh, a cellar basement wall or foundation slab of individual house. But uh, I would like to remember that uh, uh, a lot of work was done uh, with the fiber and force concrete, and probably a lot of people know also such kind of application of elevated slabs made of uh, um, fiber and force concrete, even if in a large quantity, so it's uh, deflection hardening materials. And uh, we are discussing about it because uh, now I'm as a convener of EC2 in order to put that uh, rules also in the Euro code. And the problem we are ma mainly discussing is uh, uh, essentially the robustness problem about it. And uh, I would like also to, to show you that uh, there are a very huge project also of the use of this material for the wind towers, but also for this uh, very interesting uh, solution to to keep energy from the sea or from the sea. And uh, for instance, this is something uh, developed in Rio de Janeiro by Professor Toledo Fio. So I suppose that this material is very good, especially also for the environmental uh, structure, where you need uh, uh, or you face uh, in comparison with steel. And so in this case, it becomes also very convenient in, uh, in terms of, uh, of the market. Everybody knows that uh, there is a longer uh, history of uh, um, attempts in order to keep uh, symmetric uh, the material behavior, the concrete behavior material. And uh, we started with reinforced concrete after pre-stressed concrete. Now there is also the attempt of fiber reinforced concrete. But all these three attempts require a certain time. So even if now we are going faster and faster, even for fiber reinforced concrete, we had to wait about um, 50 years or perhaps something more in order to arrive to put something in a real international code, like, uh, and not in only in uh, uh, national guidelines or, or national standards. In my opinion, there are essentially two main reasons. The first one is uh, a theoretical reason, because uh, in order to, to do this, uh, uh, we need to use the fiber after cracking. So that means that we have to know very well the fracture mechanical problem. And uh, uh, we arrived to, 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 know, uh, to, to increase our knowledge on this subject only in the last 20 years. The second one was a, is a, a technological reason, because uh, for a long time uh, it was, there was a, a sort of limitation in terms of uh, uh, fiber amount inside of the, of the mix. And so we couldn't substitute uh, uh, significantly the reinforcement with fibers. But now also we have uh, a lot of additives that allow us to arrive to pump uh, 100 kilogram of uh, uh, fibers, for instance, uh, of a, a cubic meter. And so this means that uh, technology is ready. Uh, if we look to the fiber market, uh, we see that uh, the main part of the fibers, uh, if you look this uh, uh, graph, uh, 
is concentrated in Europe and uh, probably the reason is not that uh, we discover because everybody knows that uh, the techniques was uh, mainly uh, discovered in USA but uh, we had the advantage to arrive to this point when the technology uh, put in the market also the uh, additives able to overpass the barrier of the fiber content in the, in the concrete and so we could uh, solve the workability problems uh, and so this is the reason why probably now Europe is the ma main market for that. Uh, if you look to the, uh, to the type of fibers, uh, steel fibers of course is uh, dominant, but uh, also synthetic fibers are beca <laughs> becoming uh, very promising. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why we uh, introduce uh, not steel fiber and force concrete in the model code, but fiber and force concrete, because we know that uh, this model should uh, 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 give some ideas for the next probably 20 years, so we couldn't uh, uh, focus our attention only on steel fiber, even if it's uh, now dominant. You see that uh, also in Europe we have a lot of producers, so there is not only one, and this means that there is a strong interest for developing this material. Uh, if we look inside of the model code, we have essentially two chapters. One is uh, the 5.6, uh, which is mainly related to the um, material behavior starting from the classification and after we pass to the constituting laws uh, because we are trying to use uh, of course uh, the performance uh, uh, in, uh, um, in equilibrium computation and uh, um, after there are some subjects like the orientation factor which is very important for uh, fiber and force concrete uh, and uh, the second chapter is uh, mainly a, a structural um, chapter and uh, I will try to, um, to discuss this uh, afternoon only the main principle because I don't have the time to enter in all the equation. Uh, but uh, I suppose it's uh, quite uh, important to emphasize the, the main principle. So as I told you before, fibers are not only steel but also polymer, carbon, glass and natural materials. So we open the door to all the type of fibers but we put only one warning. It's obvious that our knowledge comes mainly from steel fiber for concrete. And this means that we have to be careful when you use fibers with a very small young modulus because the risk is uh, to have other problems like uh, creep, for instance, like uh, uh, phenomenon, phenomenon related to thermo hygrometry. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, we don't have enough uh, experience about it. So if you use other type of fibers, you have to, uh, to do enough experience and to practice uh, in order to, to uh, to, to verify that the material is uh, close to the, mat to the material we used uh, uh, to propose such equation. And uh, anyway, um, we also open the door to the fiber and force concrete because, uh, pardon, the hybrid fiber and force concrete. That means that we believe that probably the future uh, is oriented to, to use such kind of material, which is probably the most promising because uh, you have a lot of parameter, mechanical parameter to optimize and this could be very nice uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you adopt uh, a performance based design for the uh, progress of the, uh, of the production of concrete. Um, about uh, the use, uh, we divided from uh, a structural use, from uh, a, stru a use which is uh, denominated not structural, even if we can debate about uh, the denomination, but we uh, would like to emphasize that in some cases when you have structural use, uh, you use the constitutive laws and so you put in the equations the contribution of fibers in terms of stress uh, crack opening. And in other case, uh, we have just uh, the experience, so experimental data that uh, uh, highlight that the work, the, the benefit is, uh, is real, is very important, but uh, we don't have enough experience to quantify with uh, uh, a constitutive law or mechanical approach uh, this contribution. So we split in this way uh, the double use, but it's obvious that especially for the serviceability limit state, it's very important also the second one, so the non-structural use. It's enough to think perhaps to polypropylene fiber for the uh, spalling, um, explosive spalling. And uh, uh, I'm also uh, convinced that the main uh, 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 in Gino of the uh, progress of this material comes from the serviceability limit state because uh, with uh, in this state uh, fibers can really play a, a fantastic role. Um, it's enough to think to fatigue, it's enough to think to durability, it's enough to think uh, um, to um, uh, other effects uh, related uh, to the simple uh, stress uh, pattern. 
Uh, if we look to the behavior in compression, um, it's very important, but uh, it's not so easy to, um, to take into account that uh, Italy is a, 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 a seismic uh, uh, country, so we know perfectly that uh, uh, fibers can allow us uh, to conserve a certain uh, residual compressive strength even after the peak, but we don't have enough uh, um, experience at the moment to, um, if you like, to suggest the equation. So we prefer to say, to write here that uh, you can change the toughness, but the peak remains the same. So due to the fact that, generally speaking, we uh, design our structure uh, trying to, uh, to keep this point, the peak point, or if you like, uh, a small ductility in, in, in compression, we, we would like to not emphasize this, uh, this uh, advantage, that in any case, it's uh, very important, especially when you have redundant structures. Um, if we look to the behavior in uniaxial tension, you see that uh, the, main, uh, in, uh, uh, the main contribution comes uh, after the, uh, the peak. So this is a uniaxial tension test. You see that the peak practically doesn't change. Sometimes uh, if you don't mix very well the fibers, you risk even to have something less. But uh, if you put here, this is a percentage by volume. So this means about 30 or 60 kilogram of fibers for cubic meter. You can, uh, you can save a certain residual strength. So this residual strength is nothing when using uniaxial tension, but becomes very important if you have just uh, bending, or even if you have uh, a circular plate uh, supported, uh, simply supported on the perimeter. That means that uh, if you increase the redundancy of your structure, you can profit as much as possible by the residual strength offered, so by the toughness offered uh, by the material. And so we have to consider that always the main contributions come after cracking. You see here, for instance, uh, the situation of plain concrete, and the same here in bending, simple bending, but uh, there is a huge increase of toughness and ductility if you, in, if you put inside uh, the fibers that give us, in unaxial tension, only some toughness. Um, if you increase the redundancy, so for instance, if you consider a slab on grade, which is very well known because we use for pavement, uh, this difference becomes uh, uh, very important. You see, uh, for instance, uh, in this case, we have essentially two different uh, uh, um, soil. This is a neoprene one, so it's, a, a, if you like, a classical Winkler soil. And this is a sand, a layer sand. And you have a, a plate over, and uh, you see that uh, uh, the uh, red curves represent the response of sand, and the blue curves the response of uh, uh, neoprene, so the something which is very elastic. These are separated in order to reproduce as the best the single spring. And you see that with plain concrete, you have a very brittle uh, response because the size of the plate is, is small. But if you have uh, a, a redundant structure, so you have a soil, uh, and especially uh, you introduce fibers, you can have with 30 or 60 kilogram a very uh, ductile response with uh, also an hardening. The same conservation was done by, uh, by Falkner before the Postdamer Platz. You see here the same situation. He had the cork. The sides of the slab were, were larger, so three meters times three meters. And you see what happens without any fibers, so very brittle failure. And if you have fibers, you have a completely different failure. You have some cracks, but no cracks uh, was enough open in order to keep to allow uh, the, the water to permeate the, 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 whole f the overall foundation. So that means that uh, you have a, a very interesting uh, behavior, especially when you have uh, strong redundancy. Another, uh, another subject well highlighted by uh, Professor Fackner was also uh, the fatigue, or better, if you like, uh, the increase of the crack width uh, with, uh, with cycles loading cycles, they, in order to use in, in uh, railway sleepers, uh, uh, he suggested this very simple test. Uh, you see there is a bending moment which is negative, and there are some uh, uh, reinforcement inside, and uh, he measures the crack width evolution with the cycles uh, in case of fibers and without fibers. So there is a strong difference, and this means essentially durability. When we speak about uh, uh, the uh, the constitutive behavior, and uh, we have to dis distinguish uh, the different response. We speak about uh, of softening or hardening material. And after a long, dis long discussion, we arrive to the conclusion that the best way to, dis to differentiate the, the response is the uniaxial tension and not, and not bending, because otherwise it could be very difficult because we have to 
uh, you are affected by a lot of parameters. So we speak about uh, of softening material when generally you have just uh, one crack, so you have localization, and you, we speak about hardening material only when you have much more than one crack. It's obvious that in this case the material is alone, so without any reinforcement. Because it's obvious that if I put also some reinforcement, you can have uh, with uh, uh, even a small uh, amount of fibers uh, a hardening material. But speaking only of uh, fiber for concrete, this is the main, uh, the main distinction we did. And uh, it's also very important to, f uh, to highlight one problem uh, that uh, Professor Josvarab and myself, we, have, we had to, to face uh, all over the time. Um, it's important to conserve the standard unified for all the type of fibers because uh, in a lot of situations, due to the fact that we uh, use uh, uh, more and more the, uh, the self-compacting uh, material, uh, according to the casting direction and cutting, for instance, this plate in different way at right angles or parallel to the main casting direction, you can have a completely different response. That means that you couldn't analyze the material in one direction with one standard and the, in the opposite direction with another one. So we really need only one standard for all the type of materials. And uh, in some cases, especially when you have a thin walled element, uh, the best, uh, um, the best uh, test is something which is not notched, because in this way you can really appreciate also eventually the sedimentation of the fiber inside of the thickness, and so you can have really an idea if your material and uh, with certain thickness is uh, hardening or not in bending. That sometimes uh, um, makes a difference. Um, so we proposed uh, uh, as a starting point this, uh, this uh, graph that uh, highlight how uh, you can have in uniaxial tension with only fiber and force concrete material different uh, uh, trend after the main uh, first cracking, if you like, and uh, uh, according to the softening, you could have uh, increasing the redundancy a different behavior. So for instance, if you look here, you have three line. The solid one is uh, the best. And uh, you see that the solid one, when we pass uh, to bending, becomes uh, hardening here. Uh, the other two remain softening. But when we increase the redundancy, so we have, for instance, this plate, which is uh, much more redundant than the previous structure, you can have also, in this case, uh, uh, the second one, so the uh, shortest dashed um, uh, line, which remains also hardening. And uh, uh, it's obvious that if you start from a hardening behavior in uniaxial tension, you remain hardening also in, uh, if you increase the redundancy. But I would like to uh, highlight that uh, it's not so easy to find uh, a material which is really hardening in tension in all the directions. Because sometimes you have, but only one direction, because uh, is a, a lot of situation you have a self-compacting material, but sometimes at right angles you, you don't have. So you have to specify very carefully this point. In order to uh, compare the different material and to have a unified market, we proposed uh, a, a very simple test. We already um, uh, calibrated the, in, in a previous work uh, in, inside of Ryland work. And this is a three-point bending test with a notch. Uh, probably, mechanical point of view, this is not the best. But uh, uh, in order to solve uh, uh, and to become uh, much uh, practice, we analyzed this test. And at the end, uh, we are convinced that it's the easiest uh, test we can do in order to appreciate uh, the real mechanical performance of the fibers. So uh, for instance, here you see um, what we name as the load in function of the crack mouth opening displacement. That means uh, the, the opening measured as the bottom side. And uh, you see that if you, have, if you don't have any fibers, you have the gray um, area. But if you have fibers, you, you conserve a huge toughness. That means uh, generally you change the global measure of the toughness of two order of magnitude. And, uh, we try to uh, introduce uh, the simplest uh, measure that uh, the uh, conventional civil engineering is used to adopt, that is uh, the equivalent flexural strength. This is essentially the bending moment divided for the elastic modulus and in bending by considering only the critical depth. And in this way, we can uh, deduce two main parameters uh, which uh, are different uh, uh, because uh, they take into account different uh, uh, crack opening thresholds. So 
One is uh, good for the serviceability limit state, so we have only 0.5 millimeter of crack mouth opening displacement. That means something related to 0.41 at uh, measured as the tip of the of the notch. And uh, the other one is uh, FR3, that is uh, 2.5. Millimeter, which is something related to the generally to the yielding of reinforcement if you have in parallel also reinforcement. Uh, so, um, for instance, if you define a certain material like uh, the mix uh, is uh, here suggested, you can uh, uh, identify a, um, a table like this where you distinguish the different value of the characteristic uh, serviceability, uh, a flexural strength. And according to this, and uh, to the spatial, uh, not the spatial, the, the conventional uh, the, uh, computation of the characteristic value, you can, uh, um, you can uh, qualify and classify your material. So for instance, if you speak about uh, of uh, four C, four means that uh, you have a characteristic value which is between uh, four and five, so it's larger than four, and uh, is C means uh, that uh, starting from four, uh, and you multiply for 0 0.9, you have uh, a uh, ultimate uh, limit state uh, uh, strength, uh, flexural strength, which is higher than 3.6. And so in this case, we have 3.77, and uh, we have uh, a denomination which is 4C. So in this, may, in this way, you are able to compare any kind of material. So there was a long discussion about also the definition of the uh, different material in this, in this uh, classification, especially ultra high performance material would like to use a uh, smaller specimen, but uh, in my opinion this is very helpful because sometimes uh, the huge value you can obtain with the very small thickness is just uh, uh, obtained because the thickness is small. So it's, uh, it's much better to compare on the same test. For instance, uh, uh, a material which is very close to ductal could be 12 or 14 in this classification. But if you look to the, to the strengths suggested by sometimes by the company, you can arrive to value which are close to 20. So there is a difference, but the difference is, doesn't, doesn't come from the material, but comes from the different tests you use to qualify it. So it's very important to have a unified classification. And we are also working at the Eurocode level in order to keep perhaps uh, to uh, enlarge a little bit even the classification that probably the different country can uh, arrive to define only some classes inside of this general framework. But it's very important that anybody, uh, everybody uses the same frame in order to, to be uh, able to adopt and to use as the best uh, this material. Um, it's not enough uh, to have some toughness. It's also very important to define a minimum uh, uh, performance. And the minimum performance can be uh, fixed according to a performance-based uh, approach. That means that we measure the ratio between the serviceability and the limit of proportionality. So the peak, uh, if you have uh, a, a softening behavior, otherwise something which is related to the crack opening uh, fixed uh, value. And uh, you need at least uh, 40% uh, uh, to save at least 40% of your limit of proportionality. And, uh, uh, for, as a serviceability limit state, uh, and you need also another ratio of about uh, 0 0.5 between the ultimate limit state and the serviceability in order to define it a structural fiber reinforced concrete. Otherwise, you can use, you can profit of the benefit of this per, of toughness, but you cannot uh, enter in the definition of the constitutive laws, and so you cannot use as the ultimate limit state on uh, every time so you need uh, a stress crack opening law. It's also very important to highlight that uh, due to the fact that we use this material after the cracking of the matrix, we always define the constitutive laws as stress crack opening, not stress strain. So we have a, a problem to passage from stress crack opening to stress strain. You see that here we propose uh, the two easiest uh, model, which is uh, rigid plastic or linear elastic uh, in the softening or in the hardening. And this is the uh, easiest way. And we can deduce this uh, parameter according to a defined crack opening, which is uh, a ultimate crack opening. I will come uh, in few slides to define it. And uh, we can correlate this, param this uh, parameter to the flexural strengths we defined in the classification. So um, it's uh, quite easy because, uh, for instance, if you adopt uh, a rigid plastic model, the model is this one, so you, we come from uh, flexural strands that adopt uh, a virtual elastic uh, uh, modulus. And uh, uh, due to the fact that we have to conserve the same bending moment, 
and we adopt the idea that uh, all the compressive force is concentrated only on the top fiber, you can easily to fix uh, a relation between uh, the rigid plastic plateau uh, in, tensa in universal tension with respect to the flexural strengths uh, uh, defined as the ultimate limit state by the uh, free point bending test. Um, if we would like to adopt uh, the linear post cracking behavior, in this case, uh, you need uh, um, more complex uh, uh, relation, but the idea is just to use uh, this uh, model in uh, serviceability, so elastoplastic, and uh, uh, simply uh, rigid plastic uh, with uh, a linear softening uh, if you are as the ultimate limit state. And according to simple equilibrium equation, you can deduce uh, the relation between this uh, parameter and the flexural strengths. Here there are some uh, computation we did in order to justify the relation. Uh, I would like just to, uh, focalize, to, to highlight that uh, the main relation uh, suggested in the model code with uh, this uh, relation between uh, uh, the serviceability and the FR1 is fixed uh, on some assumption. Uh, that means that we are on the weakest uh, uh, range of toughness for this material. But uh, I, I invite everybody who, are in who is interested to use as the best uh, uh, this model to look uh, in the structural concrete journal where we uh, enter in the detail of this, of this relation. Um, of course, we can also identify from bending very with uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, process which are essentially based on the equilibrium, but they don't focalize only on two point uh, the relation. But in this case, uh, you can arrive to some uh, uh, relation which, which are not so easy to implement in the, in the, in the real uh, design. Um, let me uh, jump this uh, slide because I would like just to remark to you that uh, uh, we need a bridge between the stress crack opening and uh, the stress strain, but uh, let me jump to here. Um, the relation between uh, the um, stress crack opening and strain uh, it's not so difficult to understand because everybody knows that in uh, reinforced concrete structure we have also localization. And generally when we speak about uh, uh, mean curvature, means uh, the curvature measured between two cracks. So even here we consider the same idea. Uh, we have a characteristic structural length which has a, a size of a length which is the minimum between the spacing between two cracks or the critical depth or if you like, in order to simplify as much as possible, the overall depth if you are in a bending test. That means uh, that you are uh, trying to spread the localized crack in a, a measure, which is uh, uh, w the minimum between the two I, I, I have uh, highlighted. But in some cases, when you change uh, the kinematic model, so you don't adopt uh, the plane section model, but for instance, you adopt the finite element approach, and in model code we uh, suggest also such kind of approach, you have to change, and so you have, to, for instance, to, to take something which is related to the finite element size. So it's very important to remember that the constitutive laws start from the stress crack opening. About uh, the minimum, um, about the, uh, the ultimate uh, crack opening, we try to use this idea. Essentially, we have uh, two, uh, the minimum between two, uh, two numbers. One comes from the, uh, technologic, the technology. So we observe that uh, in, in a lot of situations, uh, analyzing the, the fibers on the market, it's not so easy to guarantee a, a uniform response after 2.5 millimeters. So we put this because generally it's something which is related also to the yielding of the, of the reinforcement or better, the reaching of 1% of the, of the strain in the reinforcement. And uh, also, we, um, we put uh, also this uh, uh, reference, which is uh, clearly uh, related to the ductility. That means that we have the characteristic structural length times a certain strain, which is different according if, if we have a variable strain distribution. So for instance, uh, bending and, uh, and uh, compression, or only bending or only uh, a constant uh, tensile strain. That means in case, for instance, of uh, a tie. Uh, if you know the characteristic structural length, uh, you can immediately pass from the crack opening to the strain. So you can redefine the same model in terms of stress strain. So it becomes very easy to adopt in the uh, model code framework. I would like to focalize your attention that starting from the same material defined from the stress crack opening, 
you can have in some spatial uh, cross section two different stress strain uh, low. So the, the same material gives you two different stress strain low. Why? Because, for instance, in this case, the blue zone has a, a crack spacing which is small, the red zone a crack spacing which is high, and so you have two different characteristic structural lengths. And so starting from the same constitutive low, you have two different stress strain low. Um, this is clear, for instance, even in some uh, test we made uh, on a uh, uh, tunnel segment where you have uh, only the reinforcement on the border. You see on the border how many cracks we have. And you see in the center, uh, of course, we don't have uh, the same uh, uh, crack spacing. The same also here for a, a roof element, same situation. We have uh, the bottom cord with the pre-stressing steel. Uh, so we have a lot of cracks on the border. And this is a distance uh, between the crack spacing in the, in the, uh, in the bottom cord. And here, this is a, the distance uh, in the flat slab between the two bottom cords. So this is very important for particular cross-section. Um, it's obvious that sometimes uh, we can uh, uh, use uh, this model in order to, um, to, to reduce as much as possible uh, uh, the, the difference between the prediction and the real uh, subject. But uh, it's also obvious that if you have a sort of elastoplastic behavior after the cracking, uh, uh, sometimes even the uh, rigid plastic model can give you the best. And uh, uh, it's also uh, important to highlight that uh, if I consider the characteristic structural length uh, equal to the depth, and you have, uh, for instance, such kind of, uh, of beam where you have essentially only, um, we, uh, only fiber reinforced concrete without any air reinforcement, uh, if you increase uh, the depth, uh, you uh, progressively reduce uh, the ductility, and so you pass from a ductile behavior to a very brittle behavior. That means that you cannot use uh, for deep uh, beam only fiber and force concrete. And so we don't need any other uh, parameter, because uh, with a structural characteristic lens, you have also the possibility to capture this very important size effect. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, just uh, a comment. Uh, in the model code, we allow the possibility to use other Test. Not only the free point bending test we, are, we would like to use for the classification. For instance, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, countries that uh, use generally uh, the, the four point bending test, perhaps even with the notch. And I would like to remark that uh, there is not a so strong, strong difference between a three point and a four point bending test. Sometimes uh, you can listen from uh, some speakers that uh, there is a huge difference because. Uh, between the two load knives, you have a constant bending moment, but uh, you forget that this is a very uh, is a, a diffusion region. So there is not really a plain section um, model valid in this zone. And this means that if you analyze carefully the st uh, stress distribution in different uh, uh, cross section, you have exactly the same with the only exception of the point where you have the loading point. So there is a huge difference in compressive stress only under the load. And the two tests are very close. Um, here, for instance, uh, a, 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 an experimental test made with uh, uh, just a three point or four point. You see there is a small difference on the peak, but after, in terms of toughness, the, the, the test practically gives you the same. Um, we, can, uh, uh, we can also check the behavior uh, of the, uh, the constitutive model we suggested. So for instance, a linear behavior. And we did uh, uh, coring directly in the uh, three-point bending test, or in this case, the four-point bending test, a cylinder. And so you can arrive, by means of this model, to a certain uh, 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 linear branch. And after, by coring, you can test the uniaxial tension and fix the end specimen. And you see that uh, the difference is not so important. And uh, we did it for a lot of cases, and this works. And, uh, uh, it's also important to highlight that uh, there is a, a huge difference between uh, um, the uh, unnotched uh, beams and the notched one, especially when you have uh, a thin walled element. For instance, if you adopt a 60 or 105 millimeter thick element, you see here the same uh, two material characterized by two different uh, um, uh, metrics. This 65 or 40 is a compressive strength and uh, two different uh, uh, fiber contents, uh, and also two different uh, aspect ratio of steel fibers with the same length, 30 millimeter. You see that uh, in some cases, 
you have that uh, um, the four-point bending test, which is a cross, is uh, give us uh, the best nominal strength versus crack opening. And the other cases uh, are close if you have, uh, for instance, this casting direction and you test in this way. But if you reverse the specimen, you can have something different. So for instance, uh, in the case B, that means uh, the case with the empty symbol, you have the worst situation. That means that it's not true that if you reduce the, the thickness, always the orientation factor increases, and so you have something which is better than the uh, conventional three-point bending test. So it depends on the concrete and the sedimentation and a lot of other parameters. Here we did the same for the other material, and you can also have a very strange situation if you don't analyze carefully. So the recommendation is when you have a thin walled element, please consider also the, not notch, the unnotched specimen and try to analyze the uh, real flexion behavior according to this uh, uh, approach. Uh, it's also very important to highlight that the material in a lot of situations is not homo homogeneous, is not isotropic. We try to do our best in order to keep it homogeneous, but in a lot of situations we couldn't uh, uh, keep it uh, uh, isotropic, so we have to accept that this is uh, anisotropic. And, uh, for this reason, we introduce an orientation factor, which is the K factor. And the K factor can increase, but also can reduce your main contribution. That means that if you are not sure of the real the distribution, you can keep the worst situation. But uh, if you measure, you can profit also in the right direction of the best uh, performance you have. Here are some examples about it. You see that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the same case we analyzed before, this is a behavior in uh, the direction uh, parallel to the casting direction. This is uh, at right angle. And if you do also this test, which is essentially a Brazilian test with two notches, we introduced recently and is published in material structure, you see that uh, you can approximate quite well, even with this uh, indirect compressive test, uh, the performance of your material in uniaxial tension. We introduced some uh, more complicated uh, laws if you want to use uh, uh, even uh, the um, toughness, especially for the serviceability limit state and uh, perhaps some uh, uh, finite element model. So you can find uh, um, more complicated uh, uh, relationship. Passing to the partial safety factor, we, uh, we would like to emphasize that we conserve the same uh, coefficient uh, we have uh, in uh, uh, concrete, in tension, and uh, um, sometimes if you have uh, a, uh, a, an improved control uh, procedure, that means, for instance, the use of, uh, uh, of structural specimens, so without notch, and so you produce exactly the same thickness, the same uh, casting procedure, and so on, you can reduce uh, such kind of safety coefficient. Um, passing to the structure, we see that uh, uh, there, are, there is a sort of classification it's obvious that we, we have to think to fibers as a sort of a distributed reinforcement. So mainly fibers substitute transverse reinforcement, not the main longitudinal reinforcement. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, also obvious that uh, um, sometimes uh, um, uh, we, we can, uh, um, we, can uh, uh, we, we have to respect uh, the uh, minimum reinforcement, that means that uh, in a, uh, the majority of the cases, especially for beams uh, or for slab, you need also longitudinal reinforcement because there is no comparison between fiber and longitudinal reinforcement when the longitudinal reinforcement is oriented in the right way. Uh, anyway, um, we introduced some uh, constraint in order to accept also in some cases even uh, a um, structure which is uh, mainly dominated by fiber and concrete or sometimes it has only some uh, reinforcement in order to guarantee the robustness. And uh, essentially, we, uh, we consider two points. You can consider the peak or you can consider this point which is related to a certain uh, deflection. The idea is that uh, when you are here, you, are, you have a, 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 a structure which is close to the classical reinforced concrete structure when you have a high mechanical ratio. Because even in the Euro code, you can design a structure which fails uh, uh, essentially with a strong uh, reinforcement ratio. That means that you are perhaps uh, at the onset of yielding, but you cannot reach it. And there are a lot of roof, roof element or other special material. Generally, it's not the best, but you can use, uh, in this case, essentially the cracking as uh, 
uh, uh, something which changes completely the flexure behavior and so gives you the, uh, the um, idea that the, the structure has some problems, so gives you enough uh, um, uh, crack pattern in order to advise you that you are close uh, to, uh, to, to the ultimate limit state. But uh, uh, in a lot of situations, we can use also a huge ductility, and uh, the behavior of the structure can be like this. In this case, uh, we can accept this number, but we have to fix uh, some uh, relation between uh, the maximum uh, deflection and uh, the elastic one, which is computed according to a real elastic behavior, not uh, the real one, but a, 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 an elastic, a linear elastic behavior, so something which is just uh, um, the product of a computation. And in this case, the factor we, as we introduce is very high. And uh, this means that perhaps due to cohesion or other uh, self-stresses inside of the, s of the structure, you cannot uh, uh, perform this uh, uh, real path. Perhaps you have some cracks, so you follow a different path, but you have to guarantee that uh, at this deflection you have a certain load. And this is very important because uh, this load, of course, uh, has to conserve. Uh, 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 this, uh, of course, it has to be larger than the cracking one, but also it has to be larger than the serviceability limit one. In the, we take into account the safety coefficient introduced uh, for the for the load. So this is uh, very important because sometimes uh, uh, we can uh, consider this as the ultimate limit state, uh, and in this way, if you have enough ductility. Uh, the structure is uh, safe uh, enough. Or um, it's very important also to highlight that when we consider the simple uh, uh, rectangular cross section, we have to introduce also another um, another condition, which is the attainment of the maximum tensile strains in the fiber from concrete. Here we have already used the uh, structural characteristic lens concept, and so you can see here that uh, you can uh, have also to respect this. So. Uh, the maximum bending moment is defined uh, according to the minimum between all this uh, statement. Um, we introduce some equation related to uh, shear. Shear is very important because uh, in a lot of situations you are forced to introduce transversal reinforcement and uh, with fiber you can uh, prevent the introduction of this. And for this reason uh, we um, introduce a, uh, essentially um, this uh, equation where you find uh, the contribution of fibers essentially at this point, and uh, with the same, is of course, is coherent with the theory or already uh, illustrated by Professor Mutoni and uh, um, Professor Sigrist. Uh, this is a shear resistance when you don't have any kind of uh, steel reinforcement. This is uh, in agreement with the Euro code. Uh, this has only a problem that we don't have when we don't have any longitudinal reinforcement. This kind of equation is not uh, cannot be used. So for this reason, we, we introduce also the other one. You see here the comparison between uh, the, um, the, the the model length, the experimental um, uh, shear capacity design, and uh, you see that uh, uh, generally the uh, different uh, level uh, introduced in the model code doesn't change too much with respect. Uh, to the different equation, with the only the main difference comes when uh, um, you have uh, um, essentially a situation where the re reinforcement ratio becomes quite high. Anyway, uh, the problem is that we don't have uh, too much cases where you measure also the mechanical performance of the material. So this is a, a very important uh, uh, problem to uh, to to go to 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 deep and. Uh, uh, another statement, in my opinion, very important is the introduction of the minimum shear reinforcement because uh, in a lot of situations, the very, the very important point is to understand if you need stirrups or not. And especially for pre-stressed uh, element, uh, sometimes you can uh, uh, prevent uh, the stirrups if you have uh, an ultimate uh, uh, tensile strength which is quite high uh, in, the, in the specification is given uh, in this equation. Um, about serviceability, uh, okay, there are some statements related to the high strength um, uh, uh, hardening material, which is uh, not so important. I would like, because it's not so easy to find uh, um, uh, hardening material in the practice, but uh, uh, about uh, uh, the softening material, you see that there is a strong contribution in the crack width computation. So you have essentially this term, which reduces uh, uh, the crack opening. And uh, um, you have uh, also, th you remember that uh, this part represents uh, only the crack spacing. Um, 
And uh, uh, this part essentially gives us uh, the average strain in the, uh, in the steel. And uh, you have also a contribution in the minimal reinforcement for crack control. And so we always use uh, the ultimate limit uh, uh, value. It's important to highlight that uh, the crack opening is not always the same. So for instance, if you have shear, the ultimate crack opening is 1.5 millimeter and not 2.5. If you have other situation, you can uh, have uh, different crack opening values. Um, it's important also to observe that uh, the rules uh, are uh, the same of Eurocode for this part, but you, uh, we have uh, in consider the, the, the contribution I already uh, underlined. Now, perhaps uh, I, I jumped. I don't know if I have uh, some time more. Probably not. Yes? Just, just a few minutes. If we look to a very simple example like this, uh, we did uh, in, uh, in Milano. This is uh, a three meter long uh, beam. Uh, this is just uh, a test we did because uh, uh, we have uh, checking, we, are, we checked uh, the behavior of this precast uh, uh, panel, which is post tension in both directions. And we would like to analyze uh, which is the behavior um, of fiber only and also fiber with post tension or reinforcement con concrete. So if we look just to the simplest case, so the case where we have just fibers, I would like to remark something. First of all, this is a uh, mixed design, the fiber t type, the response in terms of nominal strength, uh, crack mouth opening displacement. These numbers give us uh, uh, the number of fiber we measure in the uh, 30 by 30 centimeter cross-section of the beam. That means that uh, we never have uh, a real isotropic material. This is obvious. Um, the other numbers uh, just are the addition of the, for the different uh, line or, or columns. So you can have an idea of the scattering in terms of uh, fiber dispersion. If we adopt uh, uh, the linear branch I suggested, uh, and so the constitutive law suggested in the model code, you can use uh, the finite element, uh, introducing, for instance, some uh, very uh, so just a reduction of 5% in this point uh, in order to reproduce as the best uh, the real situation we observed in the four point bending test. And uh, we measured after uh, the curvature according to this disposal of uh, uh, LDTs. And this uh, is the result. So uh, if we adopt the plane section model, that means essentially uh, the conventional uh, model we have in the model code, uh, we can follow this dashed uh, curve in terms of bending moment versus average curvature. If you measure the curvature is a, uh, related to this uh, uh, crack, you have this uh, difference in the three beams we tested. So. Uh, in terms of, uh, we, we are working on the average value, so no, without any safety, without any characteristic uh, computation, so the, just the average values. And it seems uh, quite realistic. If you, um, if you do, for instance, uh, um, a computation with the finite element, and in this case adopting uh, a different characteristic structural length, according to the average or to the characteristic uh, homogeneous values, you have these two uh, responses. And uh, if you use uh, the average uh, in terms of load versus deflection for plain section, you are here. So uh, this is a uh, experimental scattering. This is the average experimental test. That means that if you introduce a characteristic value and also the safety, you are on the safe side, that's sure. And uh, I would like to give you a measure of it. If you consider the r ratio between uh, the two deflection according to the peak, you see that uh, in this case you don't reach uh, re the result. So this means that uh, you couldn't respect this kind of uh, prescription. But uh, it's also clear that uh, if you use a uh, post-tensioning or even reinforced concrete structure, conventional one, this is a response of fiber reinforced when you put only fibers in the beam. So it's obvious that you couldn't design a beam with uh, substituting the longitudinal reinforcement, but you need longitudinal reinforcement. So you need uh, fibers to substitute the, the, the stirrups, but not, of course, uh, the main reinforcement. And uh, um, if we uh, compute uh, according to the rigid plastic method or the linear softening model 
uh, the final results, the ultimate load, you see here for the rigid plastic or here for the linear softening, that means that you are not even able to respect the condition on the cracking. That means that this case is not valid, of course, from a, a statical point of view. And uh, um, we can also change uh, the, 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 um, the case. And for instance, we can uh, consider some reinforcement. In this case, uh, we have uh, five uh, uh, 16 diameter bar. Uh, so this is just a, a conventional sketch. And uh, you see what happens if we have just fibers, if you have just reinforced concrete structure, or if you add even fibers. That means that fibers give something in uh, bending, but not so much. And also, it's very important to see that if I adopt a constant characteristic structural length, which is, uh, for instance, 125 millimeter, uh, you have this value. So we are debating a long time in the Eurocode in order to have also, in a lot of situations, a constant characteristic structural length, not in the difficult cases, but in the large majority of the cases, in order to simplify as much as possible also the computation. And this is what you, what you have if you have a thin walled element with only 100 millimeters. So there is a contribution, but uh, is not so high. If we pass to a uh, plate, this is, for instance, the scattering you have uh, in a four-point bending test to qualify the product. This is the test, and this is the small scattering you have in the plate, uh, which is supported uh, uh, by some uh, uh, steel springs. That means that, uh, generally, the huge scattering you have in the characterization of the material, in a lot of situations, if your structure is quite redundant, cannot have the same scattering in the structure. And this was also taken into account in other situations. For instance, here you have a hollow core slab. You have a top uh, slab made of fiber and concrete. And essentially, you have a lot of springs which work in parallel. And that means that you arrive to define a KRD which uh, takes into account the fact that in the reality, in this case, you are not the conditioned by the characteristic value, but only by the average value, because the springs work in parallel and not in uh, uh, series. And the springs represent, of course, the contribution of fibers. There are other examples like this where you can uh, introduce, for instance, some longitudinal reinforcement just as the basis. And you can have uh, a quite ductile behavior uh, with, uh, um, for uh, retaining uh, structure like this, or even with uh, this uh, uh, slab, which is a, a test made in, uh, in Brescia. Uh, you can see that there is a, a huge difference between the first cracking and the final load because you have the redundancy given by the soil. So in this case, you can compute by plastic analysis without any problem. So let me conclude that uh, FRC is now a new structural composite material that can be classified starting from a three-point bending test, but I remark the classification should be the same for all the fiber and concrete material, otherwise we could have a lot of problem in the application. Um, the simple constitutive loads can be uh, immediately deduced by the two flexural strengths measured uh, for fixed uh, free shield, uh, or in measure in terms of crack opening, so the serviceability and the ultimate one, 0.5 and 2.5 millimeter. The stress uh, crack opening uh, uh, can be reduced after to a stress strain approach uh, by means of the structural characteristic length, which has a, a measure of uh, a length, but Pay attention, because in some situations, some special cross-section, from the same material, you can have different stress-strain low. Generally, the material is not isotropic, and so we can consider this uh, in different way at the local or the global level. But uh, we did it by means of a k-factor. At the moment, the k-factor, the best measure is a, a experimental measure. But a lot of programs are working in, uh, are in progress in order to give us an idea of how the, the the fibers are distributed uh, in, the, in the structure according to a fixed uh, uh, casting procedure. Um, the uh, ductility requirement uh, um, uh, are not so different from the conventional structure, but uh, it's also important to remember that uh, we don't need a ductile material to have a ductile response of the structure. In the, 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 the old engineer knows very well, because when you have a dome, <laughs> you have a, essentially the behavior in compression, but uh, it's enough to keep uh, close the, the ring as a, as a basis, and you can have a, a good structure. And uh, 
uh, we also introduce a KRD factor in order to take into account uh, the idea that uh, sometimes, uh, due to the reduced volume and the small redundancy you have uh, in a free point bending test, you can have a large scattering uh, as a, um, a classification point. So a, in the test uh, for identifying the mechanical performance, but you cannot have uh, the same in the structure. So you can profit of this redundancy by means of this uh, coefficient. Thank you for your attention. We, we, do, we do get fiber in India. There are manufacturers of fibers in India, but um, we are reluctant to adopt it as such because for the very same reason, structurally, we don't know how it would act. Um, we have no codal guidance yet in our country. But on the other hand, fibers being used regularly for durability, I mean, fibers are being, synthetic fibers, for example, they're being used, polypropylene fibers are being used willy-nilly in a dosage, you know, just willy-nilly. So that's one issue. The, the other thing for durability, the other thing that I want to check is about the orientation. How can you guarantee an orientation because that changes quite drastically the K-reduction factor? So how do we orient the fibers? Is it possible to, you know, uh, magnetically, or I don't know, is there some way? Now, uh, in, in, first of all, I would like to say that, uh, as I told uh, before, um, we can use the fibers for a structural use or for not a structural use. That means that if you, when you put, uh, for instance, polypropylene fibers in order to reduce uh, the explosive spalling. This is a not structural use. When you put some fibers in order to reduce shrinkage, this is not structural use because the computation of this contribution is not so easy. And so we are working on and it's not so easy to compute it. Okay? Uh, it's obvious that uh, um, we have to be careful if uh, someone uh, suggests us to use uh, only a very small percentage of fibers uh, in order to substitute reinforcement, like in pavement and so on, because uh, uh, we have, we have uh, to pay attention to not confuse the, um, the uh, mm, for instance, uh, the CE uh, mm, uh, quality uh, requirement. That means, for instance, a certain, uh, uh, a certain flexural strength uh, uh, at uh, 0 0.5 or 3.5 millimeter with uh, the real response in terms of uh, um, of reinforcement, because uh, someone uh, uh, believes that uh, if you put only 10 kilogram of uh, steel fibers in the pavement, it's enough. But uh, if you look at uh, as a mechanical performance-based design, you couldn't obtain uh, the minimum requirement of a structural design. So you can do it. Probably they are not; they don't work bad, but uh, they they are not enough uh, to substitute the reinforcement. So this is a main point. At the moment, it's not so easy to. Um, uh, to grade, if you like, the, the non-structural use, uh, because it's, there are a lot of properties, a lot of, uh, we are working on, of course, but uh, at the moment you cannot. You can test, so essentially you can use design by testing to test uh, and to verify uh, the, the, the good uh, uh, performance you are, you are trying to reach. In terms of distribution, uh, generally if you have a, a thick uh, element, like for instance a, a foundation slab, you don't have too much problem, because uh, uh, the isotropic uh, behavior is uh, in the average uh, enough uh, to, be, to consider the material isotropic. The problem comes only when you have a thin walled element. In that case, it's very important, especially if, you're using, if you are using uh, um, uh, self-compacting concrete, uh, uh, to know exactly which is the casting procedure. You, couldn't, uh, you have to design it, or you have to consider in the note. Because if you don't do it, uh, at the moment, you need uh, to introduce a worst K factor. That means that you reduce a lot uh, the real building capacity of your structure. Your construction joint, they will not be of use, isn't it? At your the construction, construction joint, joint Construction joints, uh, those properties we can't use. Uh, yes, for, uh, you, you know that there are possibilities sometimes also to prevent the construction joint uh, uh, in some uh, application we did. Uh, but in other cases, if you want to have it uh, in order to uh, prevent other problems like shrinkage, and uh, also in Europe we have a lot of situations like this, uh, you, can, uh, you can use uh, the classical, the classical uh, device, for instance, some bars, in order to, to, uh, to allow the sheer uh, building capacity. Thank you.
Sir, we are, uh, we have used fibers uh, in case of factory floors or uh, road tops just to uh, make them more tough. That means uh, small local impact created on that. Uh, it controls the cracking much better if there are fibers added to that. But uh, I'm not finding any specific guidance for uh, how to even standardize the tests for the impact tests or something like that. Are you aware of any? As, as a moment, we, don't, we, we, we are not able to standardize this effect, but we know that uh, uh, the impact resistance grows a lot with fibers. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, we analyzed uh, the behavior uh, with a, a shock tube, uh, so there is a blast uh, wave, and uh, we observed a huge difference uh, if you have or if you don't have fibers inside, because uh, it's mainly related to the toughness that it's clearly increased with fibers. Um, at the moment, there are different type of tests. There is a good uh, um, document uh, prepared by ACI on it, uh, with different uh, standardized, uh, not standardized, but different possibility to measure it. But uh, we are working on, so we, we, we are not arrived yet uh, to a standardized uh, uh, measure of it. But we are sure that it's very important. Uh, it's, uh, second, second question was, uh, uh, you had mentioned that you are trying to standardize the length of the fiber in your yes. whatever equations you are giving. Uh, I would have thought that uh, better approach could be uh, to encourage uh, research and people trying out various things is to say that if I get an improvement in a test of such an order of magnitude, then you can have whatever benefits in your equation, this, that, and leave it to the manufacturer to produce the fiber of whatever length using different materials perhaps, but aim at achieving at least this much of benefit. Uh, the second approach has the advantage that people can try out various things instead of trying to every time make the fiber of given length. You, uh, Am could, I clear could, or no? Could no. you repeat the second one, Padarik? You no, I think I uh, will discuss it uh, later on. Because ah, okay, okay, yes. Quite possibly I misunderstood your slide, uh, which you have shown. Ye yes, it will be a pleasure. No, I would like just to say that it's obvious that you have not to check uh, every time through the cross section. We, we did it because uh, we were interested to analyze uh, and to correlate uh, the dispersion to the response. Uh, if you have a, a situation like a precast situation, you can. Uh, um, you can do uh, some, you can uh, uh, carry out some preliminary test, and in that way you can analyze if uh, the prediction is uh, coherent with the, the real experience. In other case, uh, when you have a custom site, a custom place, uh, um, uh, you couldn't, but you can have, uh, for instance, a lot of measure of the, as a fresh state level, in order to, to count uh, the number of fibers without uh, a huge amount of cost. Eh? So for instance, uh, the German guidelines is oriented to do some uh, uh, numerous uh, um, uh, preliminary tests, and after, if you conserve the same uh, compressive strengths and the same uh, um, number of fibers inside of a certain volume, you can guarantee that uh, the structure is uh, isotropic enough, if you like. So it's, uh, it's uh, safe enough. The third application I had in mind uh, was with the, with the, for improving the bond. Yes. Uh, what happens is when the old days mild steel was used round bars, uh, the mechanism of developing bond was different. Mm -hmm. Now it is a mechanical wedge, forming a wedge and trying to destroy the concrete locally. That creates a zone of a damage around the bar. Could be one of the reasons why the corrosion behavior of the uh, this uh, deformed bars and the plane bars is different. Plane, plane bar behavior is superior. So if we use this kind of uh, local mixture in a slab, for instance, and only cover the reinforcement part of it using the fiber concrete, and then switch switch back to the normal concrete, will it will it improve the uh, uh, cracking around the, due to bond around the reinforcement, and thereby increase increase its durability? Yes, it's sure that the fibers increase durability. Uh, the main uh, idea is that fibers generally reduce a little bit the crack spacing and uh, also reduces, uh, uh, due to this, uh, also uh, the crack width. Uh, so 
We have a, a lot of measuring, a lot of program, uh, experimental program uh, in progress on it, but uh, the equation we suggested in the model code uh, are quite reliable at, uh, at the moment. We saw that there, are, there is a good agreement with, the, with those equation. Um, I would like to say that uh, um, uh, fibers can even uh, reduce a lot the bond uh, length. Uh, for instance, in uh, uh, wind towers, uh, I was just uh, last week in, in uh, Spain, I saw that uh, they precast uh, wind towers with only three segments in the circle, and uh, they are able to build uh, 120 meters wind towers with uh, just uh, three or four segments in the high, and uh, the connection in the ring is made only by superposition of a very small uh, overlapping, because they use uh, a material which is ultra high performance, so this means that a, a quantity of uh, fibers which is close to 100 uh, uh, kilogram for cubic meter, and in that way you can reduce a lot the, uh, the bond length, um, the bond length tra transmission. But, uh, uh, of course, we, we know this. We don't have, a, at the moment, uh, right equation, but uh, everybody can, uh, can test with his own, uh, um, if you like, uh, uh, spatial material, and especially if you are interested to prefabrication, so to repeat the same in a lot of situations, this is the best way to proceed. Eh, because, uh, you c and I know also from these uh, designers that uh, the, the main cost for the wind towers come exactly from the overlapping as a connection in the ring. So if you reduce this space, uh, there is a, a, a huge economical advantage. Thank you, sir. There, there are actually measurements to indicate that by increase of the amount of steel fibers, the transmission lengths of pre-stress pretension strength decreases. Yes. yes. So, thank you for your excellent presentation. <laughs>